This is one of a series of five videos for Hinduism. You can watch these videos in whichever order you'd like, just make sure you watch all five of them. This one addresses the question, what is Hinduism? Not an easy question to answer. The reality is there is no official religion called Hinduism. It's a nice big umbrella term that's used for all kinds of religious approaches, some of which don't seem to go with others. In short, Hinduism is any Indian religion that is indigenous from and grows out of India's sacred past. That means, technically speaking, in India, people refer to Jainism, for instance, as a Hindu religion. Jainism, from a Western perspective, is a distinct tradition, but it's Indian and it's rooted in the past. So, knowing that, let's take a look at four different ways to go about being a Hindu. One form of Hinduism is a Vedic sacrifice. Vedic sacrifices, is the, that tradition is the oldest in all of India, and it dates back maybe about 3,500 years ago or so, maybe even a little more than that. And it involves a Brahmin priest who takes the animal you bring to him, and he sacrifices that animal, cooks it, you offer some up to the god, gods, and then returns the rest of it back to you to be able to eat. It's a way of maintaining a relationship between people and the de deities. Usually there would be more than one priest because you had to have another priest or two or three to sing the songs that accompanied that sacrifice. Without the sacred songs, it's just meat cutting. So those songs, those hymns to the particular god, create the context for this to be a sacrifice. In time, 1,000 of those songs were gathered together into a collection called the Rig Veda. We would call them psalms when we talk about the hymns that were used in sacrifice in the Hebrew Bible, so we may as well use the same term for them, a thousand psalms. Vedic sacrifice isn't as big today as it used to be, but there's still occasions when it does happen. And still today, Brahmin priests play a role that's somewhat similar in a Hindu temple without the actual killing of an animal. There's a second form of being a Hindu, however, and it develops about the year 600 or so, 25, 2600 years ago, let's say. And that probably was influenced by Buddhism. This movement takes that collection of 1,000 psalms and begins to reflect on what's being said. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of gods mentioned in these psalms. So how does that all work together? And the philosophical, the Upanishad tradition, decides that there is one ultimate essence of reality, Brahman. That's not quite the same as Brahman. Brahman is the single deity essence of all reality. And all of the gods are simply manifestations, faces of that one reality. But next comes the question, well, what am I? How do I fit into this? And the answer they came up with is, we have Atman. It's our soul. It's our essence. And our Atman is not individual as though it's separated from all reality. Our Atman is Brahman. Brahman inside of us, in each one of us, thou art that. So this philosophical tradition will end up being Vedanta tradition, under the influence later on of Shankara and Ramanuja, and that continues to be practiced today, a philosophical approach that's coupled together with meditation. There's a third approach that develops sometime right around 2,000 years ago, but really hits its stride in the medieval era, the 13, 14, 1500s. It's a bhakti Hinduism. This one isn't about your intellectual exploration. This one is about the simple joy of devotion to the gods. You can think of the Hare Krishnas and the way they chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Hare Krishna, Krishna. It's more like my grandmother saying her rosary on a daily basis or going to Mass every morning before she started her day. It's that kind of a devotional action and oftentimes is focused in a home with a home altar or a home shrine with certain deities in there where people go through the process of taking care of those deities throughout the course of the day an act of love for the gods. Bhakti tradition is very strong today in India. 
A fourth form of Hinduism is what we might call Shaktiism, or, more familiar to most people, Tantric Hinduism. This is the focus on the interplay between the divine masculine and feminine. In this particular case, usually Lord Shiva and his consort. In older texts, she's known as Parvati. But in Shakti tradition, she's often just called Shakti, the feminine, or sometimes referred to as Devi or Mahadevi, the mother goddess. She has many different manifestations from Kali, that, that horrible, evil goddess of death, to Gwara, the golden-bodied one, to and on and on and on. The interplay between the masculine and the feminine is the focus. In right-handed Tantra, that interplay is a meditational process. We focus on the way the masculine and feminine work together. Opposites work together to create in the cosmos. But there is a left-handed Tantra, too. And that's the one we all get excited about in the West because it involves something having to do with actual physical actions. In Tantric tradition, there are a variety of steps, including sexuality. And during those course of those steps, people come to experience bliss. And if they experience bliss, that is the encounter of a human being with the divine. Tantric tradition is not as widely practiced as we like to believe it is, but it still is present, especially in its right-handed form. So those are your four basic Hinduisms. As you can see, the whole devotional thing doesn't necessarily need the philosophical exploration, and the whole tantric thing probably isn't looking to an animal sacrifice, so the traditions themselves don't usually overlap very much. But people are drawn into one aspect or another, and that's the way they live their lives. On to the next one.